Come on, you give life. You give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord. Great. your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise you only it's your breath in our lungs so we Our 
our songs, and our songs rush, rush like the stream. Like stream. Where we washed our sorrows under, we became like men who dream. It shall be said among the nations, there's a God who shares our dreams. The Spirit moves our generation. Shed your tears and fill the stream. God has done great things among great us. Things among us. And every eye, every eye now shines a gleam. A, a spark of light reveals the wonder. We became, we became like men who dream. It shall be said among the nations there's a God there's who a God shares, who our dream. shares our dreams. The Spirit moves our generation. Shed your tears and fill the stream. Men who dream, we are shedding tears that flood the thirsty waters.
Something beautiful out of me. I give it all. I give it all to you, God. Trusting that you'll make something beautiful out of me. I lean, I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the Maker of Heaven. I lean not on my own understanding. My life is in the hands of the Maker. I give it all. mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb this mountain with my hands wide open I will climb climb this mountain with my hands wide open Lord I climb this mountain with my hands wide open nothing I hold on to there's 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 nothing there's nothing I hold on to. 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 Cause I am so in love. I am so in love with you. There is no one else for. I'm so in love, I am so in love with you, there is no one else for me, I am so in love, I am so in love with you, there is no one else for Cause I am so in love with you There is no one else for me My name is Kalins Herald. My family and I will live in North Andover, Massachusetts. 
I would like to welcome you to the Northeast Region virtual service. This morning we have a great service for you. We have Vaughn Hickman that will be sharing communion today and Stuart Main will be preaching for us. We are continuing the transformation series that we started a few weeks ago. Today's topic will be financial health. They have asked me to share a little bit about my thoughts about Black History Month. I would like to start by just giving a little bit about my background. As you could hear, I have an accent. Um, my background is that I was born in Haiti. My parents uh, migrated to the United States um, just for the opportunity for a better education and just a better life itself. So I'm grateful for that. However, this, this, the, the, the country to, to me was a culture shock. Not only uh, the harsh winters, which um, I still have to get used to uh, after more than 30 years. Um, but when you think of black history, from a culture of all 98% black people to a culture where it's a mixed and you are treated different ways because of the color of your skin. That is different to the way that I started growing up from the, from being born to the age of 11. And then my parents still had the, the mindset of that. We still live in that same culture where the way they teach us and the way they direct us was not based on what was out there, but was based more on what they have learned in Haiti. Like one of the things that my dad used to say to us is that you need to get an education. Your education is the uh, thing that will carry you throughout your life. It will make people respect you, will make people treat you equally, will make people um, see you the way you should be seen. But I think my dad, he had the wrong mind. He had the right mind in the conversation. We need an education. Education is very important. However, there is one thing that I felt like he did not say to my brothers and my little sister that could have helped us out a little bit. He, he, he forgot to tell us the part that in certain, circumstance, uh, circ certain circumstances, you will uh, be treated not because you did anything, not because you are uh, wrong someone. You'll be treated a certain way just because of the color of your skin. There's nothing that you could have done to change that reaction towards you. There's nothing that you could have done to um, make that person feel more comfortable. It's just because the color of your skin. Now I think about it, I'm, I go to myself and go like, uh, maybe if I had my diploma in my forehead or if I dress a certain way, but that, that's not the case. Those things will not change certain people because they have biases or, or, or they grew up in certain environment where they just treat people that way. And the, the thing that I think as a Christian that helps me out a lot is just my relationship with God. I think as a young man, I was an angry young man because I didn't want people to treat me a certain way. I wanted people to treat me equally. I wanted people to treat me with respect. And if you didn't do that, you were my enemy and, and I didn't want to have anything to do with you. And I think learning the way Jesus was treated, learning how he uh, sacrificed his life, learning about his grace, learning all those things helped me to understand how all those famous black people that have accomplished those big accolades and that we celebrate during Black History Month, how they were able to put all the racism aside, all the um, uh, stereotyping aside, all those things that could have hindered them. They put all those things aside and they were able to drive forward to reach the accomplishments that they were able to. So that is one of the things that I'm trying to teach my kids. You'll be in an environment where people will treat you unfairly. And then you wonder why. And there won't be a reason why. 
The reason could be because they just don't like you. Or because you are black. Or because your hair is nappy. Or whatever reason it could be. But that should not dictate who you are. Because who you are, who God made you, is special. And I think that's one of the things that I try to teach my kids. When they look at the black accolades doing Black History Month, when they look at all the, the different stories we read about, those people had to deal with the same obstacles and the same hardship, even worse than we have to deal with today. This past year have been a little chaotic with the pandemic and and all the uh, um, protests about um, um, police brutality and and all those things that was happening could be confusing for a young adult and I see my wife and I was uh, we had a lot of conversation with our kids about all those things that's happening just to help them out just to help them filter those situations and I think one of the things that help me out a lot is a passage in 2 Corinthians 12. Um, I think of what, what was going on here is Paul was feeling a lot. He was he, he had this pain or this discomfort that he was feeling and that he didn't know how to deal with and, and he begged God to take it away. And this is how God answered him and, and, and said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's Paul speaking there. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insult, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. We cannot let anybody in this world dictate who you're gonna who we're gonna be I don't and I'm and I'm helping my kids not let anybody dictate who they are no matter if the person is racist or whatever they are it doesn't matter and I use those individuals that that I'd get all the highlight in doing black history and to help my kids understand they most likely had it harder than you would do right now but they push those things aside and accomplish what God wanted them to accomplish because they did not get distracted by people's opinions or people's feelings. So I know today as a black man, I am standing in so many shoulders of those that came before me. I'm standing on their shoulders because they went through some very painful moments so I could be in the situation that I am today. And I'm grateful for that. But only through Jesus' grace, only through Jesus' love, we could combat all the biases, all the racism, and all those things that's going on in this world. Let's pray for our service. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the time that we are able to spend together to worship you. Thank you, Father, for the um, communion that Vaughn is going to be sharing with us about his um, life and who he is. Thank you, Father, for Stuart, Father, that's going to be preaching the word, Father, helping, under this, under, helping us understand financial health, God. Thank you, Father, for Jesus, for his grace. Thank you for the way he helped us combat whatever comes our way because we could rely on him to help us deal with all those situations. Father, please be with the service today and help us, Father God, uh, to see you throughout the uh, preaching and the sharing. I love you, God, and I say all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, church family. It is uh, great to be with you. Excited for today's lesson. And uh, we are talking about some pretty difficult subjects. You know, we were talking about physical health 
not often talked about at church. Mental, emotional health. I know we just had the two weeks of workshops there with the entire BCC church and uh, had Glenn Petruzzi and all the sharers. We had our very own Evan DiBiase share this last week, and uh, he did an amazing job, so vulnerable. I was really, really proud of him. But we've been going through this Transform series, and I just want you to hear from the ministry staff. I know Jimmy feels this way. He'll be continuing to share this with you. We are so proud of our church. We know 2020 was crazy, and we want 2021 to be the year of transformation in the Northeast region, and really the entire BCC church. We are so grateful for your buy-in. Today, we're talking about a topic that I almost want to whisper. You know, we're talking today about money. I don't know if you have many positive feelings hearing from the pulpit, hearing a preacher talk about money. But Jesus talked about money all the time. You know, I heard a theologian say that Luke, the author of the gospel, you know, one-sixth of every verse that was written in the book of Luke was talking about money, which is hard to believe, but Jesus talked about money so much. And this is a sensitive subject. Can we just be honest for a second? This is a difficult subject to talk about. There is very few things that make us feel as vulnerable, make us feel maybe shameful about how we've handled our finances or money, can make us feel less than if we don't have very much money, or make us feel a lot of pride or self-reliance if we have a lot of money. You know, we can feel a lot based on finances. And so Jesus spoke a lot about money because I think it cuts to the core of our own confidence, our own feeling of worth. And really when it comes down to it, Jesus has a lot to say about money. So today is entitled Transforming How I See and Use Money. We must have a transformation in how we see it and we use it on a daily basis. You know, God has a lot to say about money, and we're going to look at a passage here that may not be the one that you're thinking of. You know, we have passages in our mind when we hear we're going to talk about money. Okay, I've got some readily available, maybe that money is evil, or that, you know, God wants us to give money to the church, and we're going to talk about tithing, and what's, what's up with that? We're not going to look at some of those passages today. There will be another lesson on Wednesday that maybe we'll get more into the practical of, of things with Jimmy uh, for the family group lesson. But today we're going to look at a passage here in Luke 16 that is a very misunderstood passage. It's a passage about a guy that actually was a liar. And, you know, when we look at this passage, you may be saying, why are we looking at this guy as an example? Why is Jesus using this man as an example? And the truth of the matter is we can learn from people's experiences, whether they're good examples or bad examples, there's a lot to learn from them. God uses this metaphor, he uses this parable, this story, to give us insight, to give us an understanding of how we need to handle our finances in a way that is shrewd and wise. God calls us to be wise with our finances. In Luke 16, verse 1, begin reading with me, it says, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. You know, he, he gets with the master and the master says, I'm going to fire you. And immediately he goes, okay, I'm losing my job and I don't have the talent or the strength in some of these other areas and I'm definitely not going to beg. I'm too ashamed to beg. And so he starts to plan. Look in verse 4. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil. That, that is a lot of of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, and how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. 
For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. Wow, you look at this passage of scripture and how Jesus is describing the situation. First of all, as I read this, I would be thinking, is he commending lying? Is he commending this man for doing this kind of shady deal, right? That he's going to cut the debtors, uh, you know, right in half the, the amount of olive oil or wheat, uh, the things that they owe his master. They're, he's going to steal in, in some ways from his master in order to have these friends that are looking after him after he loses his job. And so you look at this, you're like, what is Jesus trying to communicate here? What is he trying to help us understand? As I said earlier, there are lessons to be learned in stories, whether it's good examples or bad examples. But he does give us some insight in verse 8, saying, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. You know, God requires us to be shrewd and wise in the way that we manage our money. Now, again, like I said at the beginning, some of us have a lot of money. Some of us have very little money. Some of us feel like this is a very sensitive subject, and others of us feel like, fine, whatever, we can talk about it. Wherever you're at this morning, I want you to hear that this lesson is not about trying to get you to give more to the church. This lesson is not about trying to get anything out of you, but instead to help you be wise, help you to be shrewd, and help you to handle and manage your money in a wise way that gives greater glory to God and actually pushes forward his mission in a more effective way than if we hadn't managed our money in a great way. We do not want you to feel like we're pitching you on anything because we're not. We want to take care of all areas of your life, including your pocketbook, including your bank account. And God does too. He has so many things that he wants us to be transformed in. And finances, for a lot of us, is one of them. You know, as you think about your own finances this morning, where are you at? Are you feeling happy with where you're at? Are you feeling encouraged, inspired, just debt-free? Or is this one of your greatest pressures? What I've found with me is when I'm going through financial struggles, when I'm feeling stressed out about my finances, I'm not a great disciple. I'm not a great follower of Jesus because I've got things to get done. I've got pressures in my life. That is why we're talking about it. We want you focused on the most important things. We want you focused on your relationship with God and not focused on all the stresses that life brings, especially through finances. We're going to look at four things of what we should not be doing with our money, what we should not be doing and how we handle our money. The first thing is don't waste your money. Don't waste it. In Luke 16, verse 1, right as the passage begins and the story begins, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. Man, how quickly money can it feel like run out of our bank accounts, right? I, you know, usually we attest wasting money to our youth. And uh, I, I know with my children, they get money from chores, whether it's a dollar or two dollars. I, I think we're still kind of in the stone ages of, uh, of allowances. We don't give very much money for allowances. Please don't tell them. Shh. One or two dollars is a lot of money in their world. And we go to the 99 cent store and they blow their money really, really quickly. If they would save their money, they could go to Walmart. To them, that's the the big place to be able to get amazing toys. And they could get something way cooler. But they can't help themselves but wasting their money on little trinkets for one dollar at the 99 cent store versus getting something that they'll really use and really play with for much longer. God doesn't want us to waste our money. Now, we're not children, and there's things that happen in our lives where we've got to spend our money, you know, because of circumstances that come up. But nonetheless, if we're going to be great managers, we can't be wasteful in the ways that we take care of our finances. The second thing that we don't want to do with our money is don't love it or live for it. Don't love it or live for it. In verse 13, it says, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We cannot love it or live for money. That, that's not how this whole thing works. I don't know if you at your job have ever had multiple bosses. 
It is very frustrating to have multiple bosses in your life. You talk to one, they give you direction, you try to carry out what they want, then the other boss comes in and says, why did you do it that way? No, I want you to do this. Then another boss pops in. It is very frustrating to have multiple bosses. We are designed to have one boss, one Lord, one director of our finances, of our life, of our focus, and that's Jesus Christ. God has to be your number one boss in how you manage and function in, with your money and handling of your money. We can't live for money. That can't be your Lord. God must be your Lord. Money is just a tool. The third thing is don't trust it for your security. Now, this is a tough one because money is a tool that can bring about a level of security, but if you've been around for any length of time, money is fleeting and it comes and goes really, really quickly. In Luke 16, verse 3, it says, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. If you ever lost your job or, you know, with the pandemic and the economy being the way it was, you know, and it is, it is very jarring to go through a loss of a job or a loss of income. And where am I going to get my next paycheck from? And, you know, trying to bank on the government, giving us stimulus checks. I mean, it is so stressful. And we can't put our security in something that is not really going to get guaranteed to give us security, right? Finances are things that, you know, they can be great at one moment and the next moment be gone in a flash. We must handle our finances in a way with the recognition that God is going to give us security. I love this passage in Proverbs 23, verse 5. It says, Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Right? I don't know if you remember that song from Space Jam. Fly like an eagle to the sea. He's saying that your cash is going to fly like an eagle away. If we put security in money, we are always going to be left wanting. God is the only thing that we can put our security in. It can't be finances. That doesn't mean we can't manage it correctly. That doesn't mean we don't use it as a tool for him and, and to help our families and us. But we can't put our security in it as our Lord. That's rightful place is God. And God needs to have that place of security in our hearts. The fourth thing, don't expect it to satisfy. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10, whoever loves money never has enough. Whew, isn't that true? Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. Wow. King Solomon, as he's sharing in Ecclesiastes, he's telling us some just nuggets of truth right? That we'll never have enough if we love money, and we'll never be satisfied with our wealth, with our income, if we have this deep love in our hearts for these things. That is never going to be quenched in your soul. In, in Luke 12, verse 15, it said, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions satisfaction will never come through finances. God is the only way that we're going to be satisfied. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is your only source and key and direction that you're going to get satisfaction from? We must recognize that there are lies being pitched to us day in and day out, that your satisfaction is going to come through your bank account. That is not true, and that's a lie from Satan. God is the only thing that can satisfy. And as we look at these four things, they are convicting. It's convicting as we look at the ways that we don't want to handle our money. But as we look at this shrewd manager, even though he was deceitful, and that's not good, God's definitely not commending that, he did do some things that I think we can learn from. And so we're going to look at five things here that we've got to remember every day when it comes to our money. The first thing it all belongs to God. Now in Luke 16 verse 1, it was all the master's possessions that the manager was squandering, right? It wasn't the manager's possessions that the master was squandering. No, no, it was the reverse. It was all the master's stuff, right? All the stuff that you have, all your possessions belong to God. Wow. I mean, think about just that phrase. Everything you own belongs to God. 
Your car, it belongs to God. Your bed, God's. Your TV, God's. All your money, your house. I mean, everything you own belongs to God. Every possession that you have belongs to God. It's all his. And you know what? It will outlast you and you will die and then it will go to somebody else. Whether it's your house or your money, you're not taking it with you to heaven. Therefore, it's God's. It all belongs to God. And if you really think about your life and your possessions in this way, it is amazing uh, just how freeing it is. You know, we're God's children. These are God's possessions, and it's God's to deal with. Now, we are managers, right? We need to handle it with respect and take care of it. But when bad stuff happens in my family, I feel the stress of it. My son is not stressed out if I get in a car accident of what we're going to do with my car. That's my problem. That's my issue to deal with. You know, when bad stuff happens in your life, the stress needs to be on the owner, God. It shouldn't be on us. Now, that's not a pass to be able to be a poor manager yourself, but think how much of a mind warp that would be if we truly thought about everything we own is God's. And so if it gets taken away, it's God's. It was always his in the first place. It was never ours, and therefore he's taking it back. If he gives us more, then amen, it's still God's. Think about the stuff that you have and the possessions you have. What's your mentality towards it? Is it mine, mine, mine? You know, I don't know if you guys have seen that movie, Finding Nemo, but these pelicans on this dock, every time they find a fish, they go, mine, mine, mine. And sometimes that's how we can be with our stuff. This is all my stuff. Don't you dare touch my stuff. Don't take my money. God's going, are you kidding me? It's all mine anyways. Therefore, we should have an absolute peace about us because it's our dad's. And it's his problem if something goes wrong with it. And yeah, we may face the punishment if, if it's our fault or if something we mismanage something, but we shouldn't be stressed out about possessions. They're all God's anyway. The second thing is God is using money to test me. Now, this is a different way of thinking. That the money that you have, one, right, it's not your own. But two, it's a test from God. That God is using the finances that you have, the money that you have, in order to test your heart. And he does it in a couple of different ways. We're going to talk about a few right now. But one way that he uses this to test us is it shows what we love the most. Money shows where our heart is really at, where our priorities are really at. Our calendar tells a lot about us. And our pocketbook, our checkbook, our, our bank statements tell a lot about what we care about the most. Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Money is an amazing test of what we care about the most. Really, when it comes down to it, it's about the sacrifice. It's about the love that we express. It's about how much we care about God. It's not this weird amount thing. You know, when we make it about an amount, we miss the very essence of what giving to God is all about. It's about this expression of gratitude and love, this intense love of I just can't help myself. I was thinking of you and I want to give more and more gifts to you, God, because of how much I love you and I'm obsessed with you. That's the heart that we need to have. And really, it's a test that shows us what we love the most. The second thing it shows and how it tests us, it shows what I trust the most. Now, this is a painful one, what I trust the most. In Proverbs 11, verse 28, those who trust in their riches will fall but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. Now, I am excited for spring to come and the green leaves to come back onto the trees in the forest all around Massachusetts, but they're not there right now. So you got to just imagine green leaves, right? But it says that those who trust in their riches, they're going to fall. It's going to look barren like the trees do right now. But if you are righteous in the way that you process finances, 
and manage your money and look at this entire arena of finances with a righteous understanding of who God is and where we can put our trust says that we'll thrive like a green leaf. Now that's not particularly inspiring to me, but when I think about a whole forest of green leaves, I get encouraged. I hope you are as well. Let us show our trust by how we manage our money, that we show our trust is in God and not in finances. The third thing that we're tested and it's shown through our test, it shows if God can trust me, right? First, we're talking about can I trust God and do I trust him the most? The the next thing here, right, is really can God trust me with these things? This is one of the the, the most powerful passages in scripture, in my opinion. In, In verse 10 of Luke 16, it says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Look at what he's saying here. We've got to be great managers of our finances because it does say something about our self-control, about our trustworthiness when it comes to other things. It says something about how much we trust in God. It says a lot about us. Again, not the amount That's not what he's talking about. Whether we're wealthy or not, there's no direction to be super wealthy. Instead, it's how we manage the little or much that God has given us. Whatever we have, if we're managing it in a way that's pleasing to God, in a way that is spiritual and righteous, God promises that he can be trustworthy, that you can be trustworthy with true riches, with spiritual riches, with things that are worth so much more than money. I know that I want that, but we've got to see that money tests us in these three areas. And actually, it tests us. There's only three. There's many other areas that it tests us in spiritually as well. You know, the third thing that we need to do is understand money is a tool to be used for God's purposes. Verse 9, the beginning part there, it says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. Now, this is probably one of the most difficult passages to understand. It almost seems like you're like buying friends or something, or that you are in some way trying to gain friends in some kind of weird way or something. That's not what it's saying at all. Instead, what it's actually saying is use money to love people. Use money to express your love to people. Use money to connect with people in a better way. You know, when we love people, we use money as a tool in the correct way. But when we love money, when we're greedy, when we care about money more than anything, then we use people and we damage relationships all around us. Money is a tool that can be used in a powerful, powerful way to bring greater glory to God, to surround yourself with people that want to hear the message of the cross because of your love that you're expressing through the use of the money that you do have. When it comes to money being a tool, the manager did handle a few things right. You know, the first thing he did is he looked ahead. It says in verse 3 that he recognized what was going on and said, what am I going to do? This is crazy. I'm losing my job. I got to come up with a plan. I got to look ahead. Proverbs 14, verse 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deceptions. We can't believe the lie that uh, it'll take care of itself the issue will get dealt with we must look ahead at what's coming and recognize that we should save we need to have a productive way of handling our money and understand what's coming up ahead you know the second thing that the manager did right is he made a plan in proverbs 16 verse 9 in their hearts humans plan their course but the lord establishes their steps We need plans with our finances. Do you have a financial plan? You could say, I don't make enough money to have a plan. I'm living paycheck to paycheck. Stuart, you don't have a clue about my life. But no matter where you're at financially, we all need a plan. Why? Because we're managing God's money. 
God wants us to have a plan because it's the best way to live our lives financially is to be able to come up with plans. And maybe this is not a strength of yours. Maybe this is something that you go, I need a lot of help. And you know what? We are so blessed in our church with men and women that are great with their finances that would love to help you come up with a plan for your finances and how to help you be set up to not just live paycheck to paycheck and to have a savings and to take care of having a savings emergency fund for your life. But we've got to come up with a plan. And we can't be those that shrink back from planning our finances. You know, the third thing is that the manager did right is he acted quickly. He acted quickly. Look here in verse 5 and 6. It says, So he called in each one of his master's debtors. He asked the first, How much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. He immediately went into action and did what needed to be done in order to set himself up. Now, he was lying, and we're not trying to help you lie. But we need to go spring into action, especially if we're in a difficult spot financially. Let's start talking about a plan now. Let's start going after getting input from the disciples around you, from the members of the church that can help you, that this is a strength of theirs. Go after this today. Do not allow another day to go by where we're continuing just to get further and further in debt and not have a plan. We need a plan if we're going to manage God's finances in a righteous way. The fourth thing that we must remember every day when it comes to our finances is the best use of my money is to get people to heaven. The best use of our money is to get people to heaven. That's what it's all about. You know, it became more clear with my dad passing away four years ago that I'm going to have a interaction with death, that I'm going to pass away at some point here. When you're young, you don't think about it very much, but then when something like that happens, you think about it a lot more often. And I think about my dad every day, without a doubt. I think about how much I love him, how much I miss him, and I think about what he's doing a lot, you know, oddly enough. Heaven, it's going to be just a, an amazing, amazing eternity. I don't even want to say an amazing time because there's not going to be a measurement of time that we're going to be able to be there praising God loving everything that's going on for eternity, fully secure, never going to get kicked out there for eternity with God. You know, I love where it talks about Jesus is going to wait on us hand and foot, that he's going to be our waiter and serve us. That's a weird thought, thinking about Jesus serving us. But that's what it says, that God is going to look after us and serve us and take care of us. You know, that is going to be amazing. What better use than for the money that we're just managing for a short time than to get everyone imaginable that we can possibly help get to heaven, get to heaven. That is the best use of your money. In verse 9, right, Luke 16, verse 9, it says, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. This is the passage we read a little earlier that's confusing, right? This idea of what, what is he talking about? It goes on, though, it says, so that when it is gone, when the money is gone or the wealth is gone, you will be welcomed into an eternal dwelling. You know, as you think about what this passage is is meaning, it's saying, help people become disciples, help people have an eternal destiny in heaven with your wealth so that when all of that is done away with, when the finances don't matter, when banks aren't a thing, where money is all burnt up and doesn't matter anymore, that you will have eternal friends, an eternal uh, connection with people as you are dwelling in heaven together. I love this passage. My dad would bring this up all the time. And I want to encourage you with this because there are so many of you that have faithfully given to special missions. There are so many of you that have faithfully given to the church for like 40 plus years. Some of you have given less than that, but you're still faithful. And I want you to feel encouraged by this as well. But especially those that have been around for a long, long time and have sacrificed and have given and are wondering, does it really matter? Does it matter what I'm giving to God? Does it matter the sacrifice? 
the special missions contributions, all the garage sales that you would do, those of you that have taken your rings off your finger and dropped them into the contribution plates for special missions, those of you that have sacrificed almost seeming like it was too much to sacrifice. Like, was I stupid in how I sacrificed back in the day? I want you to read this passage in 1 Thessalonians verses 2, 19 through 20. My dad would always preach this passage it says, for what is our hope, our joy, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and our joy. Paul is saying here, he's saying to the church in Thessalonica, but it's applicable for us as well, that when he is in the presence of God, that what will be his hope, his joy, or he says his crown, his crown jewels will be the souls that were saved because of his sacrifice, because of his effort, because of his missionary spirit of helping this church, that that will be his joy, hope, and crown in the presence of God. When you think about your sacrifice, the money that you've given, that when you enter heaven, you are going to have a crown. And it's going to be a crown of people that you've never met. It's going to be a crown of some people maybe that you've met, and, but many more that you've never met. Of how your money made a difference. Not just in this generation, not just in your lifetime, but for many generations to go. Because of the effect that you had in your sacrifice financially. Imagine what it's going to be like to be welcomed by these people. And you're just hugging people as you're walking into heaven. You finally made it. You are so elated that you made it. And who's there welcoming you into heaven? All the people that you helped save, some that you know, but many more that you don't know, that you gave financially for missions and these different causes, and they were able to become disciples and now have eternal destiny in heaven because of your sacrifice. That is is what it's all about, church. It is all about getting as many as possible to be saved. We have no, no better use for our money than to help people become Christians. Is that your focus? Is that your effort? Every day, you know, we're talking about what do we gotta do every day with our money? Every day, we gotta have a focus on using our money to get people to heaven. Now that could be taking people out to lunch, right? Coworkers to lunch and saying, I'll take you out to lunch if you study the Bible with me. That could be giving to missions and the church. And you guys have done an amazing job at sacrificing, especially in the time in the world where it is so difficult. Our entire economy is going through amazing strains. Many of you have lost your jobs and yet you're so faithful to God, so sacrificial. I want you to hear just how proud we are of you church in the ways that you give. But more importantly than us being proud, that your money that you're using that to do these things, they're going to welcome you in heaven. And you're going to be able to hear their stories, hug them, give them kisses on the cheek, the forehead. You're going to be like fired up that this is your crown jewel before God of what you did while you're on this earth. The last final thing is one day we'll have to give an account to God for what we did with our money. In verse 2, it said, so he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. I am so encouraged that this is not what we're going to hear. So many of us are so faithful in our finances, the way that we sacrifice for God, the way we sacrifice for our families, the way we take care of our finances. But we want all of us to be able to hear from God not that, you know what, you can't be my manager of my money anymore, but instead, well done, good and faithful servant. All of us are going to be called to an account. All of us are going to die at some point, and God's going to ask us how we handled the things that he let us manage for a time on this earth. I want us to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. If you are faithful with the small things, God will entrust you with the true riches let us be faithful disciples with the finances that God has provided us with, with the money that he's given us. Whether it's big or small, whether we're rich or poor, let us be incredible managers. God is so proud of this church. Let us continue to be strong in this area.
houses elsewhere. Better is one day in your course. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your course than thousands elsewhere. Good morning, my name is Vaughn Hickman. I've been a member of the Boston Church of Christ for 25 years, and I was asked to share for communion this morning. Uh, growing up in St. Louis during the 60s left me with uh, a limited involvement with um, interracial activities, um, interracial uh, relationships. In North St. Louis, it was primarily just predominantly black. Uh, there's a I-44, I-40 uh, that separate North St. Louis from South St. Louis, and that served as a, something of a DMZ. Uh, that left me also uh, with limited uh, personal relationships uh, with people who were not black. And when I left at 18, I was uh, pretty narrow in my perspective. And one of the things that I uh, have to say at this point, what's very important is uh, to recognize uh, my son Jeremy. Um, he, uh, was uh, born out of wedlock. Um, his mother, uh, Annette, and I uh, had been dating for some time, and what wasn't planned was uh, us getting pregnant. Um, I had looked for a job. Uh, St. Louis was in a bad situation at that point, and it was uh, getting more and more of a panic situation for me. That, and I was really uh, intimidated by her father's shotgun but that doesn't excuse the fact that I abandoned her uh, while she was still pregnant. Uh, going from there, I caught a bus to Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, that was in late 76, making my way from there to Louisiana. At some point, I joined the Air Force, and that was going into February 77. Uh, there's not much else um, about me that is, is really striking. Um, as much as 20 years in the Air Force has a lot to say, but that's not why I'm here this morning. Um, one of the things that uh, I've come to learn in the 25 years as a disciple is that I have to allow for a lot of uh, give and take in what I think I know. Um, the very nature of becoming a disciple was um, learning to look beyond what I think I know. Uh, my wife had been met um, at least four times by someone in the church uh, where we met in Okinawa. Um, she had been met in um, Carroll State University while she was uh, attending there. And one of the first people that uh, babysat our children, Philip and Chris, um, was here at Hanscom Air Force Base. Uh, Nancy Willard uh, was a uh, uh, our first babysitter, and she invited uh, Sylvia to church, uh, declined, and we eventually met um, Joe and Lisa Craig, uh, who um, Lisa eventually uh, did studies with Sylvia, and um, she got baptized. Um, I, in seeing uh, how Sylvia had changed in her character, knowing what she was like after 10 years of a miserable marriage, uh, saw her change, uh, visibly change in her behavior towards me, uh, towards everything in general, and knowing how strong she was confident in who she was, and saw that change, I became interested. And from there, I was baptized in 1995. Um, right now, uh, in 2021, um, there has been uh, one of the most significant changes in our country that to my memory, um, and I have mixed feelings about it. Um, I have uh, looked into our country's history, our constitution, uh, the figureheads of, of our um, institutions, and one of the things I noted is uh, the only constant is change. But this one's different. This, uh, since uh, Mr. Floyd's death, has been an incredible awakening that uh, leaves me convicted. Uh, my faith doesn't allow me to think that uh, the impossible is going to uh, 
beyond achievable. My faith tells me that if I go to God in faith, in prayer, there are going to be things that are beyond my imagination. Well, if anything else, uh, looking at um, all the different times, Martin Luther King's marches, uh, the, the entire civil rights movement, why now? Um, what's different is knowing that if I go to God in prayer, there's going to be uh, an unimaginable change, that this is just the beginning of it. Um, I've, uh, in my efforts to really get behind my understanding of our Constitution and what was their mindsets when they wrote the Constitution, um, I saw beautiful uh, words, uh, beautiful uh, goals, speaking of virtue, speaking of uh, learning from their past. These all came to nothing when it came down to the realities of politics. The realities of how they really lived out their convictions or didn't. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, they all owned slaves. They all had a, a common disgust and really overwhelmed with uh, the need to not have slavery and yet they had a country to run. Uh, sometimes it seemed like they're more led by expediency than they were with conviction. These kind of things led me to believe that um, there's a, a certain sense of detachment between one's convictions and how one lives their life. Uh, growing up in the church, becoming more mature in my beliefs, uh, led me to believe that it's, it's not something that's going to be uh, by man's doing. The, our most constructive and productive times were when we went to our knees in prayer and said, God, this is so far beyond me. It's clear that uh, if I remember my pronouncement of Jesus is Lord, there are going to be things that happen. The more people involved, uh, the more that people come together in your name, Father, there are going to be things happening that are beyond what we're asking for. I think this is what gives me the confidence that this is the time. Just as much as I had doubts about what makes it so different when I gave it more prayer and more conviction and read more into how man, despite his wisdom and orchestrating incredible undertakings, the more he couldn't do it, the only way this is going to happen, the only way this is going to come to any kind of fruition is through God. It has been my fervent hope that people appreciate their place in this though. As much as it's going to be something that God makes happen, we have to do our part. And scripture is full of so many different examples of um, how we in our day to day can make each interaction um, one that is more in line with what Christ would do. Um, our communication with each other, our being able to uh, leave an indelible mark on each other in how Christ wants us to be. Um, I know that one of the biggest changes in my marriage has been because of my ability to listen, to actively listen. This is one of the most underrated uh, behaviors that can prove to be uh, one of the most overwhelmingly productive um, acts on our part especially if a person is diametrically opposed to who we are, one of the biggest um, tools we have in getting through uh, misgivings, prejudices, uh, misconceptions is listening to the person. If we stop seeing uh, banners, uh, memes, and preconceived notions, we're going to see the person's heart and it's those moments of humanity that allow us to uh, grow together. My experience is traveling in the South, hitchhiking, something uh, really coming from St. Louis and hitchhiking in the Southeast was unimaginable. And yet there I was hitchhiking between uh, Miami, Florida, going up to I-10, uh, running to some situations that uh, I was too ignorant to know how much danger I was in, and yet ended up being 
something I thought was really an adventure. The people, in hindsight, looked at me as a person and not as my race. Uh, the gentleman that, um, despite having misgivings, he and I had a chance to talk, um, sitting down with a cup of coffee, and he heard me uh, as a person. And before he caught himself as a person who had a lot of racial misgivings, he was in the middle of inviting me to Thanksgiving dinner with his family before he realized what that looked at, like at face value. When given a chance, people will show their true selves and good or bad, being able to deal with that proved to be the most incredible uh, moment of overcoming years of misgivings. There's things that we can do in our communication that allow us to uh, not be locked into the past, learn from it, but not be limited by our misconceptions of somebody we don't even know. Finally, I want to say one of the most difficult things has been coming to terms with uh, the promises of Christ and having to have the patience to accept that those things won't take place in our time. It is God's own time that has been one of the most difficult things to wait and be patient and to allow ourselves and others to grow to where we can um, better handle what's in front of us. There are so many things that gives us excuses why we shouldn't. Knowing that I have those moments in our past, in my past, that gives me justification of why I should look forward to doing better is why I bear the burden of having to look at each person for their character and not for their outer selves. Not just their color, but their stance on things. Understanding what really drives them underneath. That requires patience that is just quite a lot of weight, but in hindsight, it's gonna look like, you know, I wish I could have done that sooner. Being in the church has been one of the most exhausting but most rewarding things I have ever known in my life. And in a different circumstance, I could talk about some of the misadventures that I've had that, again, in hindsight, are left with, what were you thinking? And that's the assumption that I was thinking. Let's go to God in prayer. Thank you, Father, for the many blessings you've given me of how we've uh, come so far. I mean, it seems like that's unappreciated. Oh, Father, it is uh, very much uh, a lesson of appreciate uh, the sacrifices that Christ made, that uh, there has to be gratitude in my heart so that I can be open to others. In a humble way, Father, I ask that you uh, forgive me for whatever prejudices that I've held into my heart, uh, but also um, help me to appreciate the grace of knowing that um, I can grow as long as I am humble enough to accept that others need to do the same thing. It is a difficult task before us, Father, but uh, we know that uh, you want us to be unified. And Father, um, that the few glimpses I've had of uh, such a wonderful union uh, makes this something that uh, will be easier to deal with if I am to live as your son Christ has uh, given us this example. Thank you, Father, for many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, church. At this time, we're going to take up our contribution. So as we normally do, you can go to the northeastbcc.com site and just go to the giving tab, or you can mail a check to the Framingham office. I do want to just say thank you, as Stuart mentioned, just for the hearts of each and every one of you. In 2020, your heart shined both in the weekly giving and in the special missions contribution. So it's so encouraging to see how we're continuing with that kind of heart in 2021. This coming Wednesday, we'll be having our midweek. I'll be speaking on two subjects. One is transforming our financial health, how to practice healthy financial habits. I'll also be giving a brief Boston Church and Northeast Region annual budget update this coming Wednesday. You'll be getting that video message this week. Next Sunday, what an exciting time we're going to have. We have the Women's Special Virtual Worship Service entitled For Such a Time as This. You should have gotten an email with all the information about the quiet times, the prayer chain, a day of prayer and fasting. That service will begin at 11 a.m. And then next Sunday, the men will have a worship service, virtual worship service, all Boston Church. That'll start at 9 a.m. We also want the new members of the region. If you've been a member of the Northeast region going back to January 1st of 2020, if you were baptized into Christ, if you were restored, or you moved into the region going all the way back to the 1st of January 2020 till the present, then we have a new member Zoom orientation on Sunday, March 21st from 4 to 5 p.m. So if you fall into that category, save the date, Sunday, March 21st, 4 to 5 p.m. And last year, I've got some exciting news to introduce two new sisters who were baptized into Christ. We call these Zoom babies because they study the Bible on Zoom. First, I want to introduce to you Karina Rodriguez from Methuen. She was baptized on February 14th, a Valentine baby. And she studied with Sabina Quinn, Mercy Lopez, and two sisters from Florida, Mirtha and Yvette. And that's so exciting. Welcome to the kingdom, Karina. And then this past Thursday, February 25th, 20 of us gathered at the Arlington building and we witnessed Holly Outlaw making Jesus her Lord and she was baptized into Christ. Holly studied with Erica and Rachel DiBiase along with my wife Maria and Holly has such an amazing story. She has a heart of gold. She's just so passionate for God. The amazing thing is many of her family members were there at her baptism and her dad was there, her grandmother was there. It's an incredible story. Joe DiBiase studied with her, her grandfather, Ernie, back in the early 80s. And along with many other family members were baptized into Christ back in the early 80, in the 80s. And then that seed was planted and Holly became our sister this past Thursday. So welcome to the family of God, Karina and Holly. And then last year with our transformation, I just want to remind you that transformation is a lifelong journey. It's a marathon. So I just want to encourage you one day at a time as we go through these different healthy uh, different topics. As we go through them, strive. Remember, we're just striving to be more like Jesus. So with that, that's the end of our service. I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye. 